kind of start things off, what I want to talk about. So there's a session later this morning where you'll have like a panel to talk about the various uh, NIDPS networks. So one of the strengths of the course is we have faculty from Neuromed, Stroke, Dead, Siren, and three um, major NIDPS funded networks that have been ongoing for a few years here. Um, they, they deal with different aspects. Neuromex, the one that I'm involved with here at Iowa with the Data Coordinating Center, um, involves really a wide range of diseases, and so we, we, we've addressed a number of different uh, disease issues. And so what I want to briefly talk about is it's kind of relevant to a lot of the problems many of you may have been seeing as you flesh out some of your protocols, kind of case studies from Neuromex, because we, we do phase two trials in Neuromex. Just to give you some, some ideas and some uh, also, examples of potential uh, landmines that we've seen and things that you might want to avoid. The, the one thing I'll start with, and this is one slide with very many different statistics that come from this, and this particular one, yeah, this is from a, a pharma publication, it's about 10 years old now. Uh, but in this example, only 11% of drugs that enter clinical testing will be approved in the U.S. And so, in a lot of situations, the statistician, and I've been accused of this many times, are the negative people in the room. I would turn that around and say often the statisticians are the realists in the room. And you heard an, an excellent talk by Eric yesterday about the, you know, aspects in the rare disease setting of trying to bring you know, drugs uh, to rare diseases and show that they're improved and stuff. I think what we have to recognize, though, is many of these things will fail, right? And so the, each of you have a great project, a great thing in mind. You've got great ideas behind it, lots of supporting data beyond it. But to be, to be perfectly blunt, the chances that everybody's drug will show that it works in the way it's expected to work is slim to none, right? One of the things in doing the clinical research is learning how to fail. There'll be a lot of failures in doing clinical research. But one of the things that I think is really important in designing trials is designing your trials, not necessarily to fail, but designing your trials so that they have a chance to fail. Because what you want to set it up for, one of the things that we strive for and trying to develop these early phase studies is often what's known as like a go no go decision. So if you meet a certain criteria, that provides evidence to go. But there's other situations that would provide evidence to no go. And what you really want to set it up to do is that if you meet your go criteria, you've met some threshold that suggests there's positive benefit to continuing forward. What is done too often and what you want to avoid is doing a trial that basically no matter what happens, whether your intervention drug works or not, you're going to meet your go threshold, right? At that point, you're not really learning anything new from that. You're moving forward with it regardless. And there's a long history. And one of the things that's, that's challenging with getting clinical trials funded, particularly through NIH now, there's a long history of things that look positive all the way through phase one, phase two, gets to phase three and fail, right? Because the phase one, phase two evidence was not as strong as it seems. That's often a function of many things. You'll hear a thing called equipoise. You guys are familiar with, with what I mean by clinical equipoise, right? In order to do a clinical trial, you have to have that. I will tell you, I have never worked with an investigator who had equipoise, right? That's not necessarily a bad thing. Each of you should be convinced that what you're looking at works, or else you wouldn't be dedicating your time and effort to do it. But I'll also say, uh, in my experience, and I think many of the other statisticians would attest to this, that clinical investigators are really, really good at two things, right? Clinical investigators are really good at coming up with great explanations for why some unexpected finding was statistically significant to come up with a great clinical explanation. And they're very good at explaining why something you thought worked was negative in a trial, right? Usually it's because the design was flawed, right? That's, that's the go-to, right? It's often hard to recognize. Maybe the drug just doesn't work. So in, in setting this up, you want to set up your design to answer an important clinical research question. Right? And, and answering it, that means that you get some answer at the end. The example I gave where you're going to meet your go criteria regardless of what you did, you're not really answering the question, right? You're just doing data, you're moving forward, you don't really know anything more than you did. So coming up with a design that has clear kind of criteria that if you meet this, you would be pretty sure that this is showing evidence to move to the next step, and, you know, the next larger study, whatever that may be. Or if you don't meet that, you're pretty confident that maybe this is not something you would want to move forward to. So part of doing that is coming up with your primary question. And this is where I think the collaboration, and, you, and you've likely seen this in your small groups, where the clinician and the statistician often have to get together and work, and it's very much 
like two foreign languages. Right? Clinicians speak a certain language, statisticians speak another language, and in developing a, a protocol, you often have to come up with a clinical question that meets both, right? It addresses the clinical question, but it's stated in a way that it can be tested in a statistical hypothesis to address the, the test at the end. And so that comes up with, you know, you, you have this, I want to do this trial that determines drug A better than drug B, right? That's, that makes somewhat sense on a large scale, but there's a lot more specificity that's needed to that question in order to put it into a protocol to develop a trial around it. So you have to say in what population, right? That's where your inclusion and exclusion criteria come in. Drug A at what dose versus drug B at what dose? And what are you looking to reduce and over what period of time, right? So for instance, if I wanted to do a stroke study to reduce the rate of recurrent stroke, right, you, you would often have to define, you're gonna look at this dose of this drug versus this dose of this drug to reduce the rate of stroke over some period of time or in some magnitude. So there's usually a lot of fleshing out that takes place, which I, I am probably, think it's likely, I know this is true, and my small group and probably many years, a lot of your early discussions probably hinged around getting, you know, specific criteria to put this, because everything else hinges on that. If you can't define this, you can't define your sample size, you know, which drives your budget, which drives everything that's gonna drive the feasibility of doing your trial. Each objective then needs to link to a primary endpoint, right? And so you have to ask the question in a specific way to define your primary endpoint, which will drive everything. The other aspect that you wanna watch out for here is secondary objectives. Particularly in early phase trials, there's often a temptation to throw a ton of secondary objectives in there just in case, right, something would find. If, if they're not really powered, then you're adding a lot of potential complexity to the study in some ways that can deviate from answering your primary question. What you really want to watch out for here are the complexity of getting the secondary objective. If the secondary objective is kind of an easy tag along to what you're doing anyway, that's one thing. If your secondary objective requires some assessment that's going to take an hour to do in a clinic visit or is going to add a lot of cost and complexity to the study, you run the risk of having many people drop out because the visits are too complicated because you've got too many secondary things, and then you miss your primary because you've made the study too complicated. Right? There, there was there's studies that have been shown that that you know I forget the exact percentage, but something like 40 percent of variables collected in clinical trials are never touched um, because somebody thought, well, we let's put this in just in case we want to look at it down the road, and that's something you want to avoid kind of data creep because the more complicated it gets, the more challenging it gets. One thing that that has helped us. In Neuromax, and I think other groups are now doing this, is involving patient advocates in the steering committees and fleshing out protocols because you can have like a patient advocate kind of weighing in on the feasibility of doing this from the patient perspective and make sure the protocols don't become too complicated. A couple of common errors that we've seen come up, these are things that have come up kind of repeatedly uh, in Neuromax as we flesh them out. Right, things, so poorly designed, opti optimistically interpreted, interpreted proof of concept studies. So these are the type of situations where I mentioned it's almost impossible to fail. You're going to move forward. The biggest one is jumping ahead too soon, where you don't really know about anything about the dose, the, the route of administration. You, you want to get to phase three so quick because you're convinced that it works, but then your phase three fails and you realize maybe we didn't know enough about dose, maybe we had the wrong dose. And so one of the common criticisms is that not enough time is spent in the early phase studies to really learn about where you should be targeting those before going to phase three. Um, uh, other aspects, you know, things that come up are, are some of the issues, and I'll address these more later. So there's, there's phase one, phase two studies. This is what I'll talk about here. So in Neuronext, we're really often a step beyond where many of you are. I think many of you are designing protocols where you'll probably do them at a single site. Right, and just with, with respect to the budgets that you have. Neuronex would be kind of the next step where you kind of got enough evidence there you want to do it kind of at a multi-site, you know, late phase one, early phase two type of setting. So in phase one trials, which I think you're mostly familiar with, this would be kind of often the first investigation of a potential new drug in humans, or maybe it's the first investigation in a disease area for some drug that's already been studied in another disease area. And often the goal here is really safety, tolerability, pharmacokinetics, pharmacodynamics. So often what you're really looking here is trying to find, in many cases, the maximum tolerated dose. Uh, you, you often assume, if not always true, but you typically assume that the higher the dose, the higher the chance for efficacy, but also potentially the higher the, the risk that you would have. And so you, what you want to do is kind of find out you know, how high can I go before you know, quote unquote bad things start to happen to know what's the target range where I might have likely efficacy as I move this forward. 
um, you know, th these are these are as close as you get oftentimes. You, 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 this is not a, a term that's, that's been a lot of favor in clinical trials, but this is the closest you get to having guinea pigs in clinical trials because often there's no clinical benefit uh, to these doing this. You might see a flag for you know, college students, especially if it's healthy controls, come in for a weekend. You, know, you often pay a lot more for this, make several hundred dollars, come in, get the drug, we'll draw your blood every hour to see what happens and make sure that it's safe. Um, as I mentioned, you're often looking at the maximum tolerated dose. And it's important even here to make sure that your design is addressing what you want it to do. So just because you say it's the maximum tolerated dose doesn't necessarily mean it's the maximum tolerated dose. So what you want to do is assess the design under certain assumptions to make sure that what you're looking at, what you conclude at the end of the study, is actually relatively consistent with the maximum tolerated dose. So you can make assumptions of various dose levels and you can run simulations for a particular design. And what you're looking to avoid in particular is what's known as overshooting. So that would be uh, a high probability of what you determine to be the MTD based on the results of your study is much higher than the actual MTD of what you might assume under a, a scenario that you're looking at in a simulation. There's, there's common um, approaches. Uh, three plus three comes up a lot that's used in oncology. Uh, it leads into other settings. It works reasonably well historically in the oncology setting where it was presented because you're dealing with highly toxic drugs where the MTD that you might accept, or the degree of toxicity you might accept might be in the 30 to 35 percent range. So that's kind of where the three plus three comes because it's all based on you treat three patients and you see what happens. And generally if one out of three or you know, two out of six have the, uh, the to toxicity, then you might stop and say that's your highest tolerated dose. So, you know, three patients, 30, 35 percent, one out of three, that makes sense. Where it becomes problematic is if you try to import this into another setting. So, for instance, I've seen this proposed in stroke settings where you're looking at maybe major bleeds as your, tox as your major toxicity. And you're not going to accept more than, say, 10 percent of major bleeds, right? There's no way you're going to accept 30 to 35 percent. So if you apply the three plus three, right, and this is, this is relatively simple math, but if you think, if you had a true toxicity of 10%, which is your maximum, the chance of seeing one out of three people is actually pretty small, right? So even if it's 10%, and you can look at if it's 20%, right, if it's twice what you think it would be, your chance of seeing one out of three is also very small. So a design like the three plus three, if you actually go through the calculations, you can see that what it would tell you is your maximum tolerated dose is likely a dose that's way above what you might actually want to carry forward. And so the dangers of doing that is you're taking, you're potentially taking a dose that's too high forward, which means you may have more safety concerns in your later studies because you haven't done a, a good enough job of really honing in on the target range that you wanted to because the design was set up with the parameters that weren't capturing it. This is where, um, so the Bayesian paradigm has been used uh, recently where you can model. And so you can uh, use this in, in, in a nutshell, I won't go into the, a lot of the specifics here, but it learns from the data that you have coming in each time. And you refit a dose response curve and you use that dose response curve to guide the direction of the next dose. To, uh, I'll walk you through kind of an example that really illustrates that. This is a study that we uh, completed a couple of years ago in Neuronex. This is in one of four. This was a, a study of an investigational agent in acute stroke that we looked at that was looking at um, uh, uh, individuals with, with four dose groups. And so they were assigned to, to you, in each cohort, we created a cohort of four. There was a placebo group because there was also some suggestion of the protection of the bleeding effect in animals that they wanted to get some preliminary data on. So each cohort of four was randomized three to one to one of the four dose groups and a placebo group. But really the main primary outcome was driven solely by those two down the dose group, looking at what the maximum tolerated dose was. You typically start small with these because from safety, uh, for safety reasons, you want to make sure it's safe at the lower doses before you move up to the higher doses. You also typically are limited to only move up one dose at a time regardless of what the data might tell you. So in, in, in this example, you might start off with enrolling individuals at the lowest dose. <coughs> you treat them, you determine how many uh, toxic events you have, then you refit the curve, and you use that refitted curve to determine the next dose. 
So obviously, if you treat all three on the dose and you see no dose limiting toxicities, your dose response curve should shift down because you're seeing less toxicity. If you see one or two, it's going to shift up, right? It's going to move more early and less later because you're using all the data that you have each time until eventually it iterates into what you hope represents the true dose response curve, and then you would use that to determine your maximum tolerated dose. The other advantage of this is that it typically treats more patients around the range of your maximum tolerated dose and fewer out of the extremes, which is kind of what you would want for moving forward. You want more knowledge in the range that is likely to be the range you're going to hold in on for future studies. So this is one example where the red curve might be where you start. So you won't always start with some dose response curve and some SMS that you would think. So this is looking at the four doses. This was the original assumption where you thought the highest dose might be above your 10% threshold, but you would think that the other three doses would be, quote, safe. So less than our 10% threshold we apply. You treat three people at the 120, so that's the lowest dose. None of them had the toxicity. It shifts it down quite a bit, right? Because we don't have a lot of data coming in. So that shifts from the red curve to the black curve there. So now all the doses are safe, but you would only move up one dose. So we're going to treat the next cohort at the 240 dose. If you treat that, you see a toxicity, right? Now it's going to shift it up because we had one out of three at the lowest dose. That's going to suggest there's higher risk at the other doses. You can see it shifts up now. It says that they're all above the threshold. So now you're going to go back down to 120, right? There were various stopping rules in place if you had too many consecutive iterations above. There's lots of complexities in to make sure the properties have the same. You then iterate it over and over until you reach some maximum sample size or some stopping rule. And this is kind of an example of how it did. So we had, in, in this study, we actually had early um, DLTs at one of the lower doses that took it longer to creep up. But then it turned out that we didn't see many more as we did that. So eventually when you look through, the red curve is where we started. That was the original um, assumption. The various dashed lines are the various fitted curves from each iteration of each cohort where it shifted. And the solid black line is where we finished. So at the end of the day, this study showed that really all four doses uh, were safe in terms to the definition of tolerability that had been applied to this study of being less than 10% toxic. So I think this is one example where it was success. There were a number of simulations that we did in planning this study that really showed the improved performance of the CRM versus other approaches, for instance, like three plus three, right? The three plus three does really good if everything is safe um, because it always goes to the highest dose, right? It does really bad if the highest dose or the third dose or any other dose is bad because it always goes to the highest dose, right? The three plus three, you can see from the simulations, it really doesn't matter what the truth is. It's almost always going to go to the highest dose when you're looking at you know, risks in the range of the 10% that we were looking at here. So the CRM, I think, does a better job and also takes advantage of all the data. So that's phase one. Most of the time, what we are looking at in, in Neuronex is phase two studies. And I, I think I kind of knew this before, but as I've been involved in Neuronex more, I've really come to appreciate this more. The phase two studies are probably the hardest to design in all clinical trials because you're trying to, you know, what you often want to do in phase two is get more information on safety and what's, you know, we typically call proof of concept, right? You're looking at efficacy, but you're not powered for efficacy, right? Really, phase three trials are complex, they're complicated, but by the time you get to phase three, your question and a lot of the key criteria should be pretty clear cut from what you know already. Phase two, you're kind of trying to come up with what you need to move forward, but you can't necessarily set it up like a phase three trial, because if you do, you either power it as a phase three trial, then you are a phase three trial, or you don't power for a phase three trial, and you're in essence doing an underpowered phase three trial, which I will tell you from my experience, and most of you have ever been on study section recently, if you put in an underpowered phase three trial as a phase two trial, that is the kiss of death with most study sections, right? I mean, that's the biggest way you see your entire grant book in the plans because there's been so much um, backlash from that in the past. And you know, an underpowered phase three trial really tells you nothing but then you get data, which is a really expensive way to get data to try to plan the phase three trial that you really want to do. The other challenge when it comes to setting this up is it, it has to do a lot with the infrastructure in place, which is somewhat challenging because phase two designs don't have as budgets as large as phase three trials almost by design. But in confirmatory designs, it's really like this example here where you've got all these kids running in a race. 
And we want to be very efficient with all the trials we do. We all strive for that. But in phase three trials, you can be a little bit sloppy and get away with it, right? You're a little bit inefficient here. You know, the data gets clean. You maybe wait till the end and clean all the data. It's not ideal, but you can do that and you can get away with it. You know, it's like here, if one of these kids falls down or some of these kids, most people aren't even going to notice it, right? They're going to get back up and get back in the race. Doing early phase designs is more like the lot. Right, you're coming across the finish line, it's just you. If you trip and fall, everybody there is going to see it, and it's going to be really embarrassing. Okay? In phase two trials, you need to be as efficient as possible. Right? Things that you can get away with as far as inefficiency in phase three trials are really critical in phase two. In the, in the webinar that we had where we talked about small trials, I talked about you know, modeling longitudinal data versus taking the baseline in the end. Right? Little things like that can make a big difference. Uh, when you're talking about these early phase trials and trying to squeeze out every bit of efficiency that you have. Because what you're <coughs> often wanting to do is get this assessment of preliminary uh, efficacy. And what we want to do is screen out ineffective treatments. And so there are things like there's, a, there's an optional session, one of the breakouts, I believe tomorrow, where Kurt's going to talk about adaptive designs. Adaptive designs are a really helpful component for these. There are other really efficient types of phase two designs. There's often, I think the excitement from a lot of these efficient designs comes from there are more efficient ways of showing that drugs work. And that's true to an extent. But really, the big advantage of a lot of the adaptive designs and the more efficient designs is that they do a better job of identifying failures early. And that's not a good thing necessarily when you're hoping that the drug works. It's not a good thing from a patient community perspective, but from a global perspective, that's good. We don't want to waste a lot of time and resources in continuing to invest things in drugs that don't work. We want to identify them as early as possible so that we can move on to other things that might work, right? If we spend five years looking at a drug that turns out not to work, that's five years of additional waste of time that could have been looking at some other optional uh, treatment. So designing trials to potentially fail is a good is a good thing. If you design a trial that cannot fail, that's not necessarily an optimal trial design. You don't want to design your trial to fail. That should be your goal, but it should be possible for your design to fail to show that the drug doesn't work. Because, and I guess I should be careful with my with my language here, because I would argue if the trial shows that the drug doesn't work, or the trial shows that the drug does work, that's a positive trial. It's a positive trial that it answered the question that you set out to do. If you get to the end and you don't have any new information, you don't know anything more about the question you set out, that's what I would term a negative trial, right? You really know nothing more after all the time and the resources that you've invested in the study than you do before you start. So what you really want to do is make sure you have more knowledge at the end, one way or the other. Some examples of things that have come up that we see uh, relatively um, common on, on the early calls we have is there are often Challenges. You heard some of the discussion last night about challenges of coming up with endpoints. So if there's a disease where the optimal endpoint is not known, then you might say, I'm not sure what the optimal endpoint is here. I want to put a, several endpoints in the trial because I don't want to miss it, right? That's a common thing, right? Maybe there's five or six different endpoints you could look at, and you want to look at all of them in a sense because one of them might be the magic endpoint that you would need for your trial, right? That's okay in one sense, but if your criteria are such that if any of these five endpoints shows any positive benefit, that's my go decision. It's pretty easy to run simulations and show that even if the drug doesn't work, it's a little multiple comparisons issue. That's actually the next talk, so this is really relevant to what we'll get into next. You have a high probability of seeing something, whether it's true or not. And so if you look at enough things, you're going to find evidence to go forward. Then you might look at that endpoint. If it's a type 1 error, you're going to spend a lot of resources doing the additional study that might um, fall apart. Um, the other thing is often, uh, you know, due to business implications, due to our own biases, uh, early phase studies with positive findings are more likely to be highlighted. I mentioned that we're really good at coming up with explanations. You can, you can take two people can look at the same data, right, if it's not a definitive conclusion. And if someone is convinced that the treatment works, they can look at the data and be convinced that it shows evidence of efficacy. And someone who's convinced that the drug doesn't work can look at the exact same data and be just as convinced that it shows that it doesn't work. And so often, um, you know, there, there's these, these inherent biases that we have. We're more excited about type 1 errors, right? One of the challenges, so there's this whole discussion in science 
of replication, right? Replication and reproducibility. One of the things that's often not taken into account if you're trying to design a replication study is that if you design a replication study and you power it just like a typical study, that's not the true power of that study, right? Because the only reason you're doing the replication study is because the prior study was positive. And so you're not conditioning on the fact that you're only looking at a potentially positive study. And so there's some risk that that's the type of error. And so there's, there's an inherent positive bias just the fact that it's positive. Studies that are negative don't get repeated in, in most cases, right? So that's something that's a small, you know, 12 subject preliminary thing where you've got some big effect. Maybe that's an important thing to move forward. Maybe it's just a fluke, right? If the, if the variance is really high, maybe that's something that just looks promising. But it's exciting, especially if it's a disease area with no treatments. It looks like it might be promising. We want to move that forward, but you have to take into account that there's usually a lot of noise for these general things, and the things that look good are going to get more attention, whether or not they're actually true or not. The other thing that you watch out for is often there's budget limitations, right? There's limitations to what you can do for phase two. This also gets into kind of the subjective nature, right? If, it, if it's not really set up, you know, statistically to answer a question one way or the other, you're, you're based it on some subjective look at the data, you have the same problem I mentioned just a few minutes ago, that different people can look at the same data and come to very different conclusions. There's a number of different types of phase two studies. This is by no means all inclusive. Um, this is just some examples of things that come up. And it kind of, they kind of fall into two general categories. So using different endpoints than the phase three endpoints. And I'll talk about one example of that. Or using phase three endpoints not powered for efficacy, so it's not powered like a phase three, but there are designs that can use a phase three endpoint and are set up in a way to address uh, the question of interest. And I'll give one example of, of, of each from what we used in Neuronex. Um, one thing that can come up in phase two, particularly if it's a drug being used in a new area, or maybe it's approved in one disease and you're looking at another, is just a safety tolerability. So maybe you don't have a lot of preliminary data. You want to get preliminary data on your endpoints to get a sense of how you might power it. But you need to have some question of interest. You might set it up safety tolerability, right? So that there's some primary hypothesis that it needs to be shown that it's safe to a certain threshold or that it's tolerable to a certain threshold. Uh, an example is a trial that we recently completed in neural in 105. It was an intervention study in Huntington's treating irritable uh, patients with Huntington's disease. And this looked at two doses of this intervention versus placebo and was comparing tolerability. And so this is a disease area that has no treatment, so there was an assessment of whether the drugs were sufficiently tolerable compared to placebo. And the way it was set up is if the drugs were tolerable based on some pre-specified threshold of tolerability, then it would provide evidence that it would make sense to move forward and then to look at clinical endpoints to see whether there was any clinical benefit. Several things can be set up for safety. So not through Neuronex, we're working in a study with the Michael J. Fox Foundation for Parkinson's, looking at Dilatna, which is a cancer drug that has some preliminary evidence in Parkinson's, but it's because it's a cancer drug, there's really some serious concerns about side effects. So there's a safety study that's ongoing there to try to determine, is this sufficiently safe that would justify doing a larger study to look at whether there is this clinical benefit that's been suggested. So that's one potential option that can be used. Another is, is a surrogate endpoint design. And this is one that I think will be used more often in coming years. It has a lot of appeal, where the idea of a surrogate endpoint design is tied to a particular type of biomarker that can serve as a surrogate endpoint, where with many diseases, to show benefit, especially if it's, if it's a scale that takes a long time to see progression, then it may be a long study. The longer it takes to show benefit, the harder it is for you know, companies to be willing to invest in programs to develop drugs, right? Because the more cost it's going to be to take it in. If you have a biomarker that you can measure in a shorter time period that might show a similar effect that would correlate with the longer term clinical effect, then you can often uh, propose a phase two trial with the biomarker to get your proof of concept to see is there some hint that you're seeing effect on the biomarker. And if you see that, then you can use that to justify doing a larger study to look at the clinical. The challenge with those in many different diseases is we just don't have really good biomarkers particularly surrogate endpoint biomarkers in a lot of different disease areas. So that's a whole different problem that we won't talk a lot about. There's a biomarker group here where you may be getting into this stuff. But the need for better validated biomarkers, and if we get better validated biomarkers 
One example of a study that we did complete that did this is the, uh, the 102, so the second study we did at Neuronex, which is a, a, an MS study in primary and secondary progressive MS looking at an interventional drug, where the idea here was the, the, the long-term goal was to show that there's some clinical benefit of this drug. This is a drug um, that has been approved for a number of years in Japan to treat asthma, that this company, Nova, is now looking at various uh, you know, neurodegenerative diseases and thinks there's some appeal there. There, the endpoint, you know, so it would be a large study to show clinical benefit, but the idea here was you could do a smaller study using imaging data to determine whether the drug slowed brain atrophy, which was thought to be a surrogate marker for clinical benefit. Doesn't prove clinical benefit, but it's thought if you could show that there's some slowing of atrophy in the brain, that that would be suggestive of, you know, of something that would be uh, willing to move forward. So this study, which was published um, last fall in the New England Journal of Medicine, looked at that, it showed, so you can see uh, various plots uh, on the top. The red line is the atrophy in the abutilast group, which was the interventional agent. The blue line is the placebo group. And what we saw in this cohort of 255 patients was individuals who were randomized to abutilast had 50% slowing of their atrophy over a two-year period versus an individual on placebo. So, you know, it, it's not a massive amount because the atrophy is relatively small in magnitude, but a 50% reduction is somewhat uh, informative. So that met the primary endpoint, which suggests that at least with this atrophy endpoint, there was some slowing of the progression. There still remains the question of clinical benefit. The study wasn't powered for that. That was kind of a secondary endpoint looked at here. And if you look at time to disease progression, so this is based on the EDSS, it's uh, not significant, but there was a trend towards benefit clinically. And so the next step there is now there's evidence on the surrogate endpoint. The next step would be to look at an adequately powered phase three trial to determine can you see clinical benefit here. So this is an example where you're looking at a surrogate, which is thought to be related. And the preliminary data here suggests that it, it might be doing a good job of what we suggested. But this is not dependent in terms of a regulatory perspective. It would have to go to the phase three. But there's pretty strong evidence here that would justify doing a phase three trial. Uh, the other example where maybe you don't have a good surrogate and you want to look at a study, again, you want to avoid doing an underpowered phase three study for various reasons, would be a futility design. Which I will say, I, futility designs, in my opinion, are very effective as a phase three design. They have a horrible name because nobody wants to set out to show that something is futile. Um, and so really, if I could go back in time and convince people to change it, the better name would be a non-superiority design. Is what you're really trying to do in a futility design, to put it in a nutshell, right? Typically when we do a hypothesis test, the null hypothesis is that there's no difference in the two agents. The alternative is that you have an effect, right? And what we want to do is disprove the null hypothesis and show that there's a clinical so if we reject the null, we conclude there's a clinical benefit. If we don't reject the null, it means one of two things. Either maybe the intervention worse, right, on the other hand, or it might be a little bit better, or there's no difference, but it's not big enough to meet our effective interest. But futility design is a slightly different take on that. So the null hypothesis with the futility design, and this requires thinking about what your phase three would be, the null hypothesis in the futility design is saying that your effect is at least as large as the clinically meaningful effect that you would seek to show in a phase three study. And your alternative is that it's not. Okay? So if you think about it, delta is what you would power a phase three study for. Your null hypothesis is that you have an effect of delta or larger. Your alternative is that it's not. So if you reject the null hypothesis of utility design, what you're concluding is that you have sufficient evidence to say that you don't have a clinically meaningful effect in your data, it would not justify doing a phase three study. Right? If you don't reject it, it doesn't imply that you have an effect, because you're not powered to really show an effect, but it would say there's at least enough evidence that you might have an effect um, that would justify doing a phase three to determine whether your lack of rejected utility was due to the fact that you really have an effect, or maybe it's small effect, or there's no effect that doesn't meet your criteria, but it would justify moving forward to the phase three. You also will get preliminary data on your endpoint, variants, other things that you might need to power that study, but it's done in a way that there is a very rigid threshold. And one of the early, so uh, Yuko Palish, who works with the USC group, was involved with this early on, and did a paper um, 
the specifics that Valerie can correct me, they did this wrong, but if you go did like an examination of some of the past stroke studies that failed in phase three, we showed that a number of them would have met the futility criteria of phase two study if this had been done. Right, so I think this is really effective at avoiding going to phase three with data that would suggest it's not optimal to go to phase three because there was no rigor put into the phase two design. Um, what this means, though, that you have to keep in mind is it has high negative predictive value. So if utility is declared, it's pretty high probability that the intervention does not work. But it has low positive predictive value. So lack of showing utility doesn't imply that it works. That's the next step in doing the phase three trial. We completed the fertility design at Neuronex at Einstein and Gravis. Just recently, this was done with Richard Nowak at, at Yale. And this was looking at um, prednisone sparing with rituximab. So there had been a prior study that suggested that treatment with rituximab would receive um, a, a reduction in the prednisone dose above and beyond you know, that, that you might get with the strategy alone. And so here, the clinically meaningful effect for like a subsequent phase three trial was a 30% um, increase in favorable outcomes for treatment versus placebo. So here our null hypothesis is that the difference in the response rate for the rituximab group versus the response rate for the placebo group was greater than or equal to 30%. So there was a 30% or greater increase in the positive response rate associated with treatment versus an alternative hypothesis that there was not. And so if you look at going through the power calculations, this is in essence a sense of with the power that we had, this was a relatively small study, you know, 15 individuals, so randomized one to one. You can kind of see an example. If you assume here that the placebo rate is 40%, then you can kind of see their performance. So if the placebo rate is 40%, that would argue that the treated rate would need to be 70% or greater to be a 30% threshold that we said was going to be meaningful. If it's 70% or greater, you can see that we have probability of declaring futility of 10% or less, which is our specified type one. So the green area here suggests if we actually had an effect of interest, we have a high probability of not declaring, or a very low probability of declaring utility that we would likely meet our go criteria for moving forward to phase three. Similarly, if it's 40% or less on treatment, so if the treatment was equal to or worse than placebo, that's the red area where we have relatively high power to reject utility. And then there's this whole area of yellow in the middle which is saying maybe there's some small effect, it doesn't meet our criteria, we're not likely to declare futility, but there is some chance. And so this is set up so that if we're in the red area, we would declare futility with high probability. If we're in the yellow, or if we're in the yellow area, we might, we might not. I say yellow really funny, makes a snicker down, because my southern accent coming through. So I don't say yellow, I say yellow. Um, uh, if we're in the green, we would go forward. So a lot of it, we don't project utility. What that's telling us is we're likely in the green or yellow <laughs> area. And the whole idea of the phase three trial would be to try to differentiate which that might be. In, in the study, which this was presented at AAN, the, the paper is still uh, in the process of being submitted, actually met the criteria for futility, right? And so what this suggested was, if you look here, um, the rates were a little bit higher in rituximab, but not much and nowhere near our 30% response rate, which would declare that based on this data, there did not seem to be sufficient evidence to conclude that it was highly likely to see a 30% increase in the uh, response rate due to rituximab in a future phase three trial, which would suggest it's not really uh, viable to, to look into a phase three trial. So again, this addressed the question I mean, the confidence intervals here are pretty wide, right? And so if you didn't have any type of rigid criteria, just look at the confidence intervals, you could argue, you know, it could be as high as, you know, 2.41, which looks like a really high odds ratio, but it did meet this specified, pre-specified criteria for utility, and I would argue it did exactly what it was supposed to do to try to address the question. So these are just a few examples of phase two type designs that we've seen in Neuronex. But, you know, we could talk all day about different phase two designs, and in many cases, it really depends upon getting into the specific question of interest and coming up with a design that's appropriate for the specific study that's being looked at. Um, what that might be might be very different from anything that's on any of these slides. But the big take home take away message that I think that I would like for you to take from this, if nothing else, is that when you set this up, you should really think about what are your go and no go criteria. Right? And if, when you finish your study, 
what threshold would you like to meet where you would be fairly convinced that you have an effect? And similarly, if your drug doesn't work, which we all don't like to think about, but if it didn't, what in your study would be set up in a way that would tell you that maybe this isn't the best path to you know, move forward with in terms of study? And you want to make sure that you address both those questions. And if you do that, then you've got a strong study design that can move forward. And at the end, do what the ultimate goal is, right? So our, 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 our ultimate goal from a global perspective is to try to find treatments that are good for the various diseases that we're looking at. Our ultimate goal when we're planning an individual protocol shouldn't necessarily be that. That's our high level goal that we would like to achieve. Our ultimate goal in developing a protocol is coming up with one that answers the question, is this drug worth continuing to study or do I not have sufficient evidence to do that, right? And if you set it up in that way, at the end, you will have a clear answer and you will know one way or the other. And if your answer is to move forward, you'll have much stronger evidence and a much higher likelihood of success down the road because you met some more rigorous criteria to do that versus I just collect data and I look at it and decide whether it's good. So that's that's a summary, uh, kind of general overview. I'd be glad to take any questions that people have about any of this or other aspects of phase two style. I think we have about five minutes. Chasing 
I mean, the other aspect of that, even if, even if it was a valid estimate, is at the end of the day, um, we have to keep in mind that we're not chasing statistical significance or you know, statistical effect at all. Statistical significance without clinical significance is really meaningless, right? And you can, you know, one of, one of the so, you know, p-values are like being slammed in the literature right now, right? If you review the journal of medicine, this kind of new thing that came out last week with that. But one of the big misconceptions of p-values, and I talk about this in classes when I teach all the time, is a lower p-value doesn't mean a bigger effect. Because right? I can get a p-value as low as I want it, regardless of the effect, if you give me enough resources, you enough people in there, and I can show that a blood pressure reduction of a tenth of a millimeter mercury is statistically significant if you give me millions and millions of people. So we have to keep in mind that what we really want is not statistical significance, we want clinical significance. And at the same time, p-value of 0.05 may not be the magic bullet for it. In, in some of the rare disease settings that we talked about yesterday, right, you might have big effects that won't meet that criteria. You have to come up with alternate ways to look at it. So I, I agree it's a problem. Exactly how to get around it, I, I'm not sure there's a single answer to that, other than recognizing that it's a problem. Yeah. How do you define uh, clinically significant differences on a dichotomous endpoint in that I mean, to me, it sounds like the difference between 40 and 70 percent is like ginormous. Yeah. So, like, like you know, this comes up in stroke trials, and then we say, like, oh, an improvement of outcomes of about 8 percent, but maybe I'd be happy with three. And nobody wants to fund the study to compare two analytics with that that tighter compass, that better. And I think, um, well, so in this example, it was a larger study because we're testing that as something side effect. Right? You have to have a relatively large effect in order to do that. Um, other situations, it kind of depends. And so um, I think it's, it's, this is where the grantsmanship issue comes into play. And the more evidence you can use to show that, right, it helps. And so we did a study years ago over the center here in pediatric migraine where the investigators actually polled you know, people who were treating kids with migraines on how much difference would you need to see and it would change your prescribing practices, right? So then you could give evidence that this is what the expert said, right? So if you had a small difference in something, it wouldn't necessarily change behavior, but if you had this level of effect, what would it, uh, what would it be? I, I think the part that is that you have to watch out for with what you're talking about is you, if you start to pick your clinically meaningful effect to fit into the budget that you can do for your trial, that's driven more by um, by what you can do versus what the science is. Often, that's pretty, at, at having reviewed grants, that's pretty easy to see through as a grant reviewer, right? And, you know, and it's what I would determine a sample size justification, not a sample size calculation. You already picked your sample size and you're trying to back into um, you know, specific parameters. Um, oftentimes, like that, that's a bad approach just because it becomes pretty blatantly obvious that there's very little clinical rationale for this. It just kind of fits into what you want to do. So, I, again, I think the more evidence you can get, it's really, this is one of those things where I think clinicians often look for the statisticians to tell them what the clinically meaningful effect is, and it's really more of a clinical question. It really gets to, at the end of the day, right, particularly in a phase three space, what size effect would you need to see that if you presented this and published this, people would pay attention and it would change their behavior, right? That, that's, in essence, what a smallest clinically meaningful effect would be, right? If this is statistically significant, it's a great finding, but most people would look at it and say, yeah, it's not gonna change what I do, then it's probably not in that threshold. That's really what it boils down to, and that's more of a clinical 